Last night started off pretty normal. Most of the downstairs lights were off when I got home, but that was to be expected. Mary doesn't mean to do it, but she always seems to forget that her husband works the graveyard shift, meaning he will be coming home most nights when both she and the son are fast asleep. It was nothing to be angry about though. I simply planned to bust her for her constant forgetfulness the next morning and nothing more. Anyways, I hadn't eaten anything in the last few hours. So rather than going straight to bed like I always do, I decided to pop a frozen pizza into the microwave, just to silence my growling stomach. That break of routine, as meaningless as it seemed at the time, is probably the only reason I am writing this post. Once I opened the beeping microwave, I saw that the clock read 2.49am. I almost regretted staying up to eat this pizza and I truly could feel my eyelids getting heavier with each second, rather than move to the table to eat. I ate right in front of the microwave. I or Mary could clean up any mess in the morning. I just wanted to get some food in me and get some rest before I had to follow the same tiring schedule all over again the next day. From where I was eating, my front door was roughly 90 degrees to my left, and only about 15 feet away. I could see my front door and the small window beside it if I was looking that way. But at that point, I wasn't focused on anything other than devouring my pizza. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed that the motion lights had just unexpectedly turned out. Other than being surprised, I didn't pay much attention to it at that time. We live in a pretty wooded area and get animals moving around through our yard all the time. I was sure that whatever was out there was nothing of note. Maybe a badger or something of the like. After a minute, the lights clicked back off. I assumed that whatever had triggered them must have been scared off immediately by the lights. I returned my focus to my pizza. Once I was done eating, I dragged myself to the stairs with what little energy I had left in my body. To get to the stairs, you have to walk into the front entryway and pass by the front windows. Without thinking, I take a look out of my front window and was immediately jolted awake, and as my heart pounded like it was going to leap out of my chest, standing in my yard about 20 feet away from my door was a man. Well, the outline of what seemed to be a man. There are no street lights on our street, so the only lights in our yard were the motion lights we installed when we moved in which, as I mentioned, were off, and the dim light we keep on in the entryway radiating out of the front windows to the yard. All I could see was this outline, with head craned upwards, as if they were looking to the stars or something. I didn't really know what to do. It was a freaky sight to see. But we live in a small town and secluded community. We know literally everyone that lives around us, and our neighbors are all very trustworthy people. I figured that this person was someone I knew, so I tapped on the window to get the person's attention. Foolish, I know. Wasn't really thinking clearly, I guess. But anyway, I didn't want to wake Mary, so I tried to stay as quiet as possible. He didn't budge. No reaction at all. I figured that whoever it was out there couldn't hear me, so... I opened the door. Don't get it twisted. I was scared beyond belief. But at the end of the day, I try to see the best in people. The figure in my yard hadn't really done anything to warrant a phone call to the police. Plus, they usually take a good 10 minutes to answer a call out here. I hope to resolve this quickly and cleanly. As the door creaked open, I realized that the figure had changed slightly. He was now staring right at me. It was jarring. Two seconds prior when looking out the window, he'd still been staring upwards. I couldn't make out the finer points of his features yet, as the light from my house barely reached him, and I thought that made him all the more creepy. The figure just slowly started to walk backwards towards the road while still facing me. As the person sped up slightly, the motion lights finally came back on. He wasn't anyone I had ever seen before. He was relatively tall, six foot four maybe, and crazy skinny. Borderline emaciated, really. 
He truly looked like he had never eaten anything a day in his life. And he was completely hairless. No eyebrows, no facial hair, and bald. I was speechless as the seemingly mute and sickly person just silently observed me. And I quickly realized that he was less terrifying when he was obscured by shadows. He turned and ran away from me through my yard, across the road and into the woods on the other side of the road. I was frozen in fear. Neither fight nor flight kicked in for me. Had this person wanted to hurt me or Mary, he had his chance, but he didn't take it. I locked the door and went upstairs not really sure of what to do. I couldn't really have called the police once he was gone, could I? I mean, this guy didn't really do anything. Sure, he was on private property, but I'm sure the police wouldn't take it seriously. I figured it was useless, and that I'd rather keep my guard up in case this man came back tonight and worry about possibly phoning the police. I got very little sleep. I was sure that every rustle of the leaves or every gust of wind was the trespasser returning. I finally shut my eyes at 6am when the sun started to rise, but was up when I heard Mary shuffling to the shower at 8ish. Oh, good morning. Didn't expect you to be up. Aren't you sleepy? Yeah, but I couldn't really sleep. Tough night of work and all that. Since I'm up, why don't I make you some breakfast before you go to work? She smiled and nodded in appreciation. I wanted to tell her about the events from a few hours prior, but... I knew it would freak her out, and why wouldn't it? It was a terrifying turn of events. I don't know. I thought maybe her favorite dish of bacon and eggs would make the news easier for her. Really dumb logic in hindsight. But I guess I was still experiencing a fear-induced shock. What are we going to do? Mary was trying to be calm, but I knew by the fact that she ignored her breakfast after I explained the situation that she was freaked out. I told her there wasn't really much for us to do right now. We argued a little bit, and she made it clear that she really wanted to call the police. I still didn't think it was a good idea. We had zero evidence to prove anyone was in our yard last night. Zilch, or so I thought. What about those cameras that Mrs. Maddox installed? Didn't you link them up to your laptop when we moved in or something? We moved in about five years ago because, even though it was the middle of nowhere, the house was actually a bit closer to both of our jobs, and honestly we liked the privacy the community offered. We bought the house from Jason Maddox, whose mother was an old widower living there alone for a few years. She had been petrified of the neighborhood ever since the death of her husband. Her son sold the house on her behalf so that she could live with them, hopefully living out the final years of her life in peace with Jason and his wife and kids. Before she moved out, she had Jason install a few cameras outside her house, just to provide her a peace of mind. The things were cheap pieces of junk, and Jason himself said they rarely looked at them, but it turns out they actually came in more handy than any of us could have ever imagined. I shrugged. I guess you're the brains in this relationship after all, Mare. I'll call the boys in blue and deal with them and the cameras before I head off for work. In the meantime, do me a favor and don't get too upset about all this. That was easier said than done. But I think she was a lot calmer once I started to take her police suggestion seriously. I kissed her goodbye and got right to work on figuring things out. I poured myself a coffee and got to work. I was half expecting the bastards not to work in their hour of need because of my half decade of neglect. But thankfully I couldn't have been more wrong. I opened the software, and after a 15-ish minutes of updates, I finally saw a live feed of the four different cameras of my outside. The camera in the driveway was angled poorly to the point where you could only see a small sliver of the driveway and dense foliage, while the back and side cameras showed mostly foliage and the fenced-in portion of our yard. Jason Maddox had unsurprisingly done a piss-poor job setting up 75% of the cameras. The front camera was a comparative mecca for our home surveillance. From what I could tell from watching the live feed, this camera was angled perfectly to have captured our uninvited visitor. I went into the database and found last night's camera feeds. Sure enough, at 2.54am, 
The man crept out from the shadows and into our front yard. There it was. Concrete, undeniable proof. I called and alerted the police. And they took me very seriously once I told them I had video evidence of the intruder. The operator said that two officers would be sent to my home to view last night's video and file a police report. Alas, my relief was short-lived. Something that the operator said made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. A logical and seemingly mundane question with immense ramifications. Something both horrifying and entirely possible that I simply hadn't thought of. Does this individual show up on the security cameras any other nights? All at once, I realized how entirely possible and downright terrifying this possibility was. I mean, how many times did I lay awake in bed and see the front lights click on at odd hours of the night? Like I said, it was a pretty regular occurrence for us. I immediately checked the feed from the night before I encountered the man face to face. I wasn't sure when he might come, so I started at 9pm. I played it at 2 times speed and made it through the night without anything of note. Momentary relief. I went back one more night prior. At 12.36am, he creeps into the yard and triggers the front motion lights. I was stunned. But it got even worse. He stayed there, motionless, in complete darkness until just about 5 a.m. He was so still for almost five hours that he didn't even trigger the motion lights again until he turned around and left for the day. Think about that. While our motion lights aren't very sensitive, I know for a fact that something as simple as a head jerk from a sneeze would set them off. This guy was essentially a statue for almost five hours. As I'm writing this, I am shaken. The police arrived moments after I made my discovery. I told the two officers about the new development, and they were visibly uncomfortable. Sergeant James, the veteran between the two officers, would later tell me that he never saw anything like this in his almost 23 years on the job. We went through 33 days of video logs, and found that the man had come to my home on 27 of those nights. Besides the nights I interrupted him, his briefest stay lasted 22 minutes and 15 seconds which was five days ago. His longest day occurred early last week. He arrived at 11.57 p.m. and left at 6.13 a.m. He always stands in a similar spot in the front yard, about 20 feet from the front door. I called in sick for work tonight, because I can't begin to describe how little I want Mary to be alone at this house when night falls. I'm terrified. So are the cops. Especially since they don't have this person for much. So far all the evidence shows is trespassing and loitering on private property. If they were to catch him in the act, and not find any reason to charge him with a more serious crime, he'd probably just get a fine or a brief stint in jail. They claim they'll have patrol cars scouring the area tonight, and one car stationed in front of my house all night, which makes me feel somewhat better but their lack of answers and their obvious uneasiness about all this makes me extremely nervous. That's all I have for now. Mary comes home in an hour, and it will be dark soon. If anyone knows anything about this situation, or just has a theory or spots a detail I missed, please let me know in the comments. I will update you all when we learn more about the whole situation, or if something of note occurs. Until then, let's just hope we make it through the night tonight. Thank you to everyone who expressed their concern for my wife and I. Between all of your kind words and the kindness of the police, it's nice knowing we aren't alone through all this craziness. Fortunately, our night was mostly uneventful, after all the bizarre discoveries from the previous day. At least one police car stayed parked in the front of our house from sundown until sunup, just as was promised and there were no signs of the mysterious individual through the whole night. I know it's quite possible he could have been present somewhere else, but you take solace in the little victories when you can get them. At two-ish, I heard the policemen moving around in the driveway. In the morning, they told me they thought they saw the person standing in the driveway, but by the time they investigated the driveway and the wooded area near it, 
there was no sign of the trespasser. I also appreciate hearing all your suggestions in the comments about how to get through these times of trouble. I'm not a superstitious man, but I definitely can't rule anything you suggested out at this point. After doing some research about Wendigos and Skinwalkers, I can say I'm thoroughly terrified by the similarities our visitor had with both of them. I sure as hell hope that our guest wasn't either of those things. Otherwise, this all seems pretty hopeless. Also, I do own a shotgun. I've never used it for anything other than skeet shooting, but having it definitely makes me feel a little safer. I'll be sure to keep it locked, loaded, and by my side until everything is resolved. Anyways, there have been some developments since last night, which I will share with you all now. For starters, I've decided not to tell Mary about the fact that our guest is a reoccurring visitor to our property. I told her that the police stayed out front all night as a favor to us, rather than their fear that we're dealing with something a lot more malicious than just a one-time trespasser. Plus, I'm worried that this might bring back some bad memories for her. She had an issue with a stalker when she was in college, and it persisted for nearly a year before she was able to get a restraining order on him. Even though she hasn't seen this person since, she's still very much disturbed by that painful experience eight years later. I spent most of last night trying to convince her to make the trip to stay at her sister's, but she refuses to leave me alone despite how unsafe our house now is. I'm walking on eggshells here. So while withholding the truth from her feels dirty, I think it's better than the alternative if she's sticking here with me. I also made a trip to town around 9 o'clock this morning to make a few purchases that should let any upcoming nights feel a little safer. The most important purchase, 15 lights that are much stronger than the ones we've had dotting our property since we moved in. These new lights are set on a timer, so I plan to illuminate just about every inch of property starting tonight. I also made a stop to my friend Andrew's house after my shopping spree. He's on the road for work right now, but since he's been an avid hunter his whole life, I knew he had something that could really up my surveillance factor. Game cameras. If you're not familiar, game cameras are cameras used mostly by hunters that are most often triggered by either sound or motion. Andrew's three game cameras were older and were only able to take still frames when triggered. But I think it's important to monitor the woods surrounding my house as well as my property. The more information I can gather on this... person, the better chance we have of getting our life back to normal. After making these stops, I got back home around noon to both set up for another tense night and to continue to find answers on who it was visiting our house. It took an hour, but I readjusted all four cameras. I'm not very handy at all. And the three I had to unscrew and remount kept falling off no matter how much I tried to screw them into place. But, thanks to my efforts, I have a much better view of the entire property of the area surrounding my house. I really don't think I'll see much on the two cameras in the fenced-in parts of our property out back, as the back fence is tall and all that can be seen behind the fence on camera are the dense trees. But you never know what could happen. What feels much more useful now is the driveway camera, which finally actually shows every inch of the driveway. Since the cops may have seen a figure in the driveway, I wouldn't be shocked if I now caught this trespasser thanks to the new angle as well. I also picked three spots in the woods to set up Andrew's motion-activated game cameras as well. Since these cameras are older technology, I won't be able to see the stills they take until I retrieve them and download their images the next morning. Well, it's a little after 4pm as I'm writing this, and I want to look through the older logs of the camera again. I'd like to go back to the earliest recordings from when Mrs. Maddox was still living here, to see if I could find any evidence of the trespasser showing up all those years ago as well. I doubt it though, since Jason or Mrs. Maddox herself would have noticed if they checked the cameras regularly like they claimed. But I figure it pays to check. I'll post any updates if I find anything of notes. Updates. Yeah, he's in the videos from 8 years ago. I looked through the first three nights recorded by the camera, and so far this bastard has shown up in their front yard each night. He hasn't done anything different in these videos though. Obviously this is an important finding, since it proves that the Maddox family might know something, 
but it doesn't really teach me anything more about who or what I'm dealing with. I'm going to call Jason and see if I could talk to his mom now. She was so high strung. She had to have noticed this person at some point. I called Jason. Turns out his mom died earlier this year. I don't know the Maddox family personally, so obviously I didn't really keep in touch with them. I hope she found peace. I asked Jason if he ever had noticed anything on the security cameras and he told me he never even checked them. When I explained that I saw someone standing outside in the video logs, he was speechless for a few minutes. I think he felt guilty. He admitted he always brushed off his mother's scared pleas to leave the house, as her mind finally slipping during the final years of her life. He said he was hesitant to have her move in with his family full time, so he gave her a cell phone in case she ever felt down or needed any help, and also told her he would install the cameras and check them nightly to be sure there was no one outside, or in case anyone ever tried to break in. Clearly he was at fault for not believing his mom, but that's not my problem. I asked him if she ever said anything about anyone coming to the house in the middle of the night, to which he replied that she would sometimes see a tall man standing somewhere in the front yard. Since she only started mentioning it the last couple of months before she moved out, he assumed she was just seeing things, and as such, decided to move her into his house instead of investigating. He also mentioned another incident that makes me very nervous the more I think about it. One night in August, about a month before we bought the house, he received a frantic call from his mom that there were people talking in the basement. Jason got there as fast as he could, but when he got there he only found his mother cowering in the living room. He saw no evidence that anyone broke in. I told him not to worry or feel guilty, and I even lied to him and told him that the man only showed up on the surveillance cameras once while his mom lived there, from what I could tell and that he shouldn't feel badly. I'm not sure if he believed me, but he seemed relieved. It sounds like Mrs. Maddox was clearly of more sound mind than was initially believed during her time living alone in this house. That left me with another disturbing but logical question. Did I have to worry about the voices she heard in the basement? Thankfully, I've never dealt with anything like that. But now I'm worried there might be someone or something else lurking inside the walls of our home, and not just out in our yard. Mary's here, so I'm going to focus on keeping her calm. I'll make some more updates if need be, but tonight will hopefully just be another quiet and uneventful night. Fuck. It's almost 10.30 and the police officers still haven't showed up to sit and watch our house like they did last night. I told Mary another fib to cover up the fact that we were still very much in danger. She's in bed already sleeping. I told her I would be catching up on the work I missed last night. I'm actually holed up in the upstairs office, with a mini fridge full of energy drinks to my right and my trusty shotgun at the ready. I plan to stay glued to my laptop all night, watching the live feeds of the outside until the sun rises and I can feel safe again. I've been watching this monitor for an hour now, and I think I'm finally noticing something in the driveway. It's just out of the light, crouched down near the woods, but it's the trespasser. He's completely motionless, but it's definitely him. I think he's been out there for a while now, but he just twitched slightly a couple times. I'm calling the police as I type this. They've been alerted, and they're now on the way. I know they'll do their best, but I probably won't see them for another 20 minutes. I've got the gun on my lap now. I'm going to bring the gun and the laptop with me into the bedroom and lock the door. For Mary's sake. Can't be too safe. In the minute I've taken my attention away from the screen to get fortified in the bedroom, he's completely changed position. That little shadow on the edge of the woods is gone, and now standing at the end of the front yard and almost on the road is the trespasser. His head is craned up towards the sky again. It's almost like he's staring at the camera, staring at me. It's quiet, eerie. I know we live in a secluded area, but... 
He just sprinted towards the house. He's banging on the door. Unsurprisingly, things since my last update have been insanely hectic. I truly haven't been able to find the time to write this next post for you all until right now, so I am sorry for all the worry I caused anyone with the abrupt ending of my previous post. My wife and I, luckily, are once again okay. We're still very shaken up by every little terrifying thing that has happened in the last two days, but thankfully we will be fine. Our bond has only strengthened during all of this, so that is a massive positive and a boatload of negatives. Before I get into the finer details about last night, I want to address something a lot of you have been saying the past two days. It was a bad move for me to withhold the truth from Mary. I thought I was doing the right thing in the moment, but lying to her was a bad idea. I could have gotten her killed, and that makes me feel awful. I came clean with her earlier today, and she handled it about as well as I could have expected. My face is still red where she slapped me, but she accepted my apology. I'm not perfect, but I'm glad that my most recent blunder didn't cause any harm. Anyways, here's something I know about what happened last night. When I heard the first bangs on the front door, I could tell almost immediately that the door had no chance of keeping out whoever or whatever was trying to get in. I posted the updates, grabbed the shotgun, and took my terrified wife to the closet. It was the safest option, really. There's only one entrance in the surprisingly spacious closet, and we were able to block the door with our wooden shoe rack. I kept the shotgun in hand until we emerged from our makeshift panic room almost a half hour later. Our house is pretty compact, and the closet we hid in is right above the entryway to the house, so we were still able to hear what was happening downstairs pretty clearly. We heard the door splinter, and then slam heavily to the floor in a heap. We then heard the heavy pounds of feet on our wood floor, as whatever was downstairs did who knows what in the entryway. The most disturbing thing we heard was its voice. Well, it's complicated. It didn't really speak. It just loudly growled and groaned gutteral gasps as it, I don't, I don't know, scurried around in our entryway. Mary cuddled close to me, whimpering, and barely managed to get a petrified whisper out to me. Is he saying words? I hadn't been focused on whether it was saying anything before then, so I tried to discern any words that I could understand and, sure enough, I could sort of distinguish what sounded like gibberish between the seemingly pained moans coming from downstairs. It was something like, Guk, Bib, Piverol, Va, He, Tezerat. It repeated these same sounds for a few minutes, making rough and sporadic stops in between them and also occasionally stopping to make pained wheezing sounds. It sounded like a man who had his vocal cords irrevocably damaged was trying to chant something. It was a terrible sound, like a thousand nails on chalkboards. Then after moments of listening to this disturbingly melodic gibberish, our home fell silent again. Mary and I looked at each other. I'm almost positive we were both thinking the same thing at that moment that we wouldn't leave the closet until we were 100% sure that whatever was downstairs was gone, no matter how quiet it got. And sure enough, after five minutes or so, we heard a loud shriek and the now familiar pounding of heavy footsteps on our wooden floor as it sprinted deeper into our house. My heart skipped about 10 beats as we heard it pounding on a door inside the house. We would have heard him coming up the steps if it was the door to our bedroom. So we both breathed a sigh of relief as we heard him forcing his way into our basement. Everything else happened almost too quickly to process. We heard the door to our basement break with a similar crackle as the front door, followed by a few thuds in immediate succession, followed by the bangs of footsteps it made as it charged down into our basement. We heard another relatively distant but still blood-curdling shriek come from the creature and then silence again. It wasn't much longer before we heard a shout coming from downstairs. The police arrived on the scene in full force probably 20 minutes after receiving my call, 
I had told the operator I was fortifying myself in my bedroom and where my bedroom was, so I wasn't too surprised to hear knocking on the door minutes after they had entered the house. I was a little nervous to leave the safety of the closets, as my imagination had me worried about whatever had broken into my house and disguising itself as a police officer to lower my guard. But when the voice on the other side of the door addressed me by name, I realized that it was Sergeant James speaking with me. If you don't remember, he was one of the officers who came to my house when I first phoned the police about the trespasser. He escorted Mary and I out of the house while the rest of the police officers marched down into the basement. There were even more officers with their guns at the ready outside. I finally felt safe for the first time all night. Sergeant James took us to an ambulance parked at the end of our driveway, where paramedics awaited us to make sure we were okay. After we were cleared medically, we hopped in Sergeant James' patrol car, and he took us to the station for questioning. I should backtrack a little bit. Even though Sergeant James clearly wanted to get us out of the house as quickly as possible, I was to observe the chaos that lay on the floor just inside my front doorway. There were the expected but disturbing sights, such as the wrecked front door lying on the floor, and the large scratch marks on the door frame. but there was one unexpected piece of evidence that disturbs me on a whole different level. The police have said nothing about it still, no matter how much I've asked. Starting on the front porch, splashed upon the splintered piece of door that lay upon the floor, and streaking all across the floor in a jagged line leading to the basement, was a dark crimson substance. Obviously, my first guess would be blood, but since this whole situation is extremely bizarre, I can't really be sure. If anyone has any ideas on what it is, or why the creature would just be bleeding all over the place, Please let me know. I don't know if the police are withholding information from me or simply do not know the truth themselves, but I can't stop thinking about it. Once we got to the police station, Mary and I were given time to relax as best as we could. We hugged each other and cried, and that's pretty much all we've been able to do since leaving our house. It's hard to relax during times like these. They began questioning us a little before 7am. Most of the questioning was uneventful, or pertained to things I already mentioned in one of these three posts, so I won't bore you all with too many details. However, one of the detectives stated that whatever I had discovered in my yard two nights ago was most likely not human. He based this on an examination of the marks on my front door frame, basement door, and some of my walls. The examination revealed that they were simply too deep and too wide to be caused by normal human fingernails. They were caused by something more durable than fingernails. Maybe a large knife, or maybe large claws. And the forensics suggest that the marks are so uniform in length and distance between each other, that they're too precise to be caused by separate blows. Unsurprisingly, they told us we won't be able to stay in our house for a significant amount of time, which I am perfectly fine with. Mary was able to get us a room in a cheap hotel for now, and we will most likely make the trip to Mary's sister's to stay with her until we figure out what to do. I'm writing this now from our hotel room. My laptop was kept as evidence, and I gave the police permission to check the surveillance cameras on it. So I'm using my phone to write this. I don't know what happened in my small, quiet neighborhood after I left my house early this morning. The police are being secretive about everything, but I don't really care at this point. I'm just glad that this whole situation finally seems to be under control. I'm going to catch up on the two days worth of sleep that I mostly lost out on. Have a nice night, everyone. The ringing on my phone woke me up half an hour ago. I answered. On the other end was Detective Laird, one of the detectives involved with combing the crime scene. I didn't know what to expect, since I'd already told the police everything I knew. He asked me how many exits there were to my house, to which I replied three. There's the front door, the back door, and the storm door leading out of the basement. I said obviously the windows would be used as an exit as well, but he confirmed that none had been open or broken upon investigating the house. There was a long pause, 
and then I heard Detective Laird swallow air nervously. Then he explained. Well, your house is currently surrounded by police officers, and it has been since the moment we got here. Not a single officer outside has seen the intruder leave your home. Inside the house. Even more officers have checked every inch of the house and haven't found any sign that the intruder is still here. I said nothing. We've checked the security feeds on your laptop as well. We watched and rewatched and rewatched again, every second of the recordings. No sign of the intruder leaving. We don't know where he went. I don't know what to do anymore. Two nights ago, after speaking with Detective Laird about the creature that broke into my home, I'm pretty sure I had a panic attack. I couldn't catch my breath no matter how hard I tried. It felt like my throat had closed up. I shouldn't have fallen back asleep after hearing that terrifying news, but I did. I had no choice. Maybe it was all the stress of the last few days. Maybe it was the panic attack. Or maybe it was something else entirely, but I did fall asleep. And that night I had the most vivid dream I've ever had. Usually my dreams are a jumbled mess of nonsense but this one seemed to flow much more coherently than normal. It seemed to tell me something. I found myself in my home's entryway yet again. It was still very much in shambles like it had been when Sergeant James escorted Mary and I to safety for questioning. The door still lay on the floor, and the trail of the crimson blood-like substance still flowed like a makeshift road leading to the basement. In the dream, this red path led down to the stairs, and into the unfinished part of the basement, which is immediately on your right once you reach the bottom of the stairs. I didn't go into that part of the basement though, most likely because I have always been terrified of that room. When we first saw the home, the room was still being used as storage by Mrs. Maddox and her late husband's excess belongings. I never really thought about why it actually made me so uneasy. My fear of that room was as strong as it was irrational as long as I've lived there. In the main room of the basement I saw Mary. She was facing away from me. I heard her whimpering and saw her shaking like she was the night we took shelter in our bedroom closet. I called to her and she immediately stopped trembling. Her head snapped towards me, but she never looked fully at me. Something about her was different. I wish I could explain it better because it was so alarming, but I can't really put it into words at the moment. With her head still turned but not fully looking in my direction, she started whispering something. We never leave, we never leave, over and over and over again. I turned my head to my left, towards the abominable room, to see that the door wasn't there. It had unsurprisingly been broken down. The crimson trail led into that room, but I couldn't see more than a few steps past the doorway. It seemed like all the light had been drained from the room. Usually there was enough natural light from the small windows to make out the outline of the room and its contents. Regardless of the seemingly amplified darkness, I was able to see the outline of a person standing there. The only thing I could tell for certain was that it wasn't the creature, because this figure was about my height. The figure stood in the doorway, bathed in darkness, and stretched their arm outwards towards me before being pulled back into the darkness. Before I could do anything in response, Mary crawled into the dark room on all fours. I tried to chase after her, but I was frozen. I jolted awake at 8.13 a.m., it took me a few moments to realize that I had just been dreaming, and that I was still in the hotel room in bed next to my still sleeping wife. Like I said, I have never had a dream quite as vivid as that one. The details of my home were perfectly accurate. I knew from that moment that the dream meant something, but I'm still not really sure what exactly. At this point, I wasn't sure if I would be returning to my home to investigate farther but the dream seemed like it was trying to tell me that if I did go to my home, there was probably something of note in the basement. Mary and I got lunch, and discussed what our next move should be. 
She was set on moving away from this place and never looking back, something that I was reluctantly leaning towards as well. We both knew that this move would alter our lives forever, and would also mean we'd have to scramble for a new way to provide for ourselves, but we didn't really care at this point. We agreed that we would make a return trip to our home to get my car out of the driveway, and that would be the last time we ever set foot on the property again. We determined that we would get there once we were done eating lunch, and meet up at her sister's house afterwards. At our house, there was the expected hustle and bustle for a crime scene, especially for one as interesting as my home. I spoke with Detective Laird in the front yard. He told me that the house had been scoured at least six more times since we last spoke, and that there was still no creature sighting to report. The police, for all the good they've done and for all the patience they've shown, really do seem to be hiding something from us. It's not that they seem malicious, but it seems more like they're on damage control and want to just deny everything. When I asked Detective Laird if I would be getting my laptop back anytime soon, he spewed out some rant about how the laptop seems to have a virus, and how they had to take it back to the station to run diagnostics, and figure out what went wrong with it. It all seemed canned. Like someone above him on the law enforcement food chain told him what to tell me, and hope I wouldn't question it. I didn't want trouble, so I told him he would never have to worry about me interfering again. As I walked to my car I remembered the game cameras I'd placed in the woods. I wasn't sure if the police ever found them, but my curiosity couldn't be contained. I decided that I had a great chance to get these cameras later in the night. Worst case scenario, the police find me, and I make up some bullshit excuse about just wanting to get my friend his cameras I borrowed. Best case scenario, I find something new that helps me understand this whole situation a little better. Regardless, I knew I had to do it to ease my troubled mind. I phoned Mary and told her that I was staying behind to help the police. I know, I'm an asshole for lying to her again. But honestly, if I told her what I was actually doing, she'd either try to keep me from looking for the truth because she was scared, or she'd want to come with me and would put herself in great danger. I think this time it's entirely warranted. I nervously drove around until nightfall. Finally, I made my way back to the house at about 9.30. It was dark and I was determined to find the truth. I really didn't want to be back at this place but I knew that if I didn't at least look for any signs that might explain all this, that I'd likely go insane. Finding these game cameras seemed like the safest way I could find the truth. The first thing to cross my mind when I arrived at my house after dark was a simple observation. It's a lot quieter now. And not just in the sense that it was nighttime. There were no police officers there. Less than six hours ago, my home had been lively. There were at least eight officers still on perimeter duty, plus many other police officers inside on Monster Watch. There were forensic crews trying to find any sort of solid evidence they could use to understand what had happened within the walls of my home. The house had fallen eerily silent once again, and once again I hated it. But I saw an opportunity. I dashed to the front porch, and inside the front of my door I found waiting for me the exact same sight from my dream. My entryway was still a chaotic scene of destruction, with the crimson path summoning me to investigate the basement. I recalled my dream and the feelings I felt down below the surface. I wanted to turn around, but instead I found myself at the top of the stairs. Looking down the stairs, I saw the destroyed door, lying right where it had in my dream. I saw the crimson trail turn right and go into the terrifying unfinished room in the basement. I thought about taking a step downwards, but the silence of the house was shattered before I could. It started as a faint, but constant and indecipherable whisper. Voices emanating from the basement. As the voices grew in volume, they became more distinct but became no easier to decipher. There were at least four voices involved, but there could have easily been more voices speaking. They all spoke at once, sometimes over each other. 
I don't know to whom they belonged. But I do know that these voices must have been the ones Mrs. Maddox heard that caused her son to move her out. This is my attempt at transcribing some of what I heard emanating from the basement. There was an older man. Does anything remain in this? Then there was a younger man. Here, there. Then there was the older man again. So misplaced. Then there was a woman. I want to... And I couldn't hear the rest. Then there was another woman. For reasons unknown. And then it was the younger man again. I lived in the dark. I truly cannot be sure that any of this text is correct. But that transcript is the best I can do. There was loud and indecipherable whispering. That was an omnipresent undertone. To what could barely be called a conversation. I also heard a woman crying at different times during the exchange. The whispering never stopped despite the other voices speaking. While the crying was sporadic, but occurred when both women's voices were speaking. I stepped onto the top step of the basement. And the damn step creaked louder than a step ever has in the history of stairs. The voices immediately stopped. So did the whispering and crying. They all screeched to a halt. The unnatural silence returned. My heart did a drum roll. I ran to my car. With my legs churning unrestricted of my brain, I didn't care anymore. Fuck the truth and fuck those game cameras. I wanted to live my life. I wanted to grow old with Mary. I didn't want to end up in the basement with whatever was down there. As I started the car, I noticed the creature was now standing in the doorway of my home. He was facing away from me, looking inside of my house. As if it knew I was looking at it, it turned its head 180 degrees to look at me. It wore the same confused look on its face that it had when I accidentally discovered it a few nights prior. It mouthed something at me, and then sprinted deeper into my house with its eyes still locked upon me. I write this final update from the comfort of my parents' beach house. Over 400 miles away from my haunted little home in the middle of nowhere, Mary and I look forward to starting our new life together far away from that place. Tomorrow begins our job search. However, I am unable to stop looking over my shoulder. Every time I hear the settling of this house, or the crackling of the air conditioning coming alive to cool our home, there still exist dark corners of our world. Untouched by the light we consider ourselves so safe inside of. If you look hard enough for them, you will find them. If you listen closely for them, you will hear them beckon you. Once you've discovered them, you will only see their darkness. We spend our lives trying to outrun them. But the truth is, we never escape them. Last night, I woke up in that basement. Mary was there. She acknowledged my presence but never looked at me. I could hear crying, but I didn't know where it came from. We never leave. We never leave.